So today we're, we're very lucky to have David Korsmeyer from NASA Ames who's um, going to speak to us about the um, Flexible Path Architecture Study for Human Missions. And um, David is the Chief <coughs> of the Intelligence Systems Division of the NASA Ames Research Center. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the polite applause. I'm going to try to speak a little loud. Uh, one, because uh, I don't have a mic. Uh, two, because you're all eating. So uh, if you can hear me over your potato chips or your popcorn, then I'm doing a good job. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a study that occurred in the summer of 2009. Uh, if you remember, there was a uh, new president just had come into office, and he asked for what was called the Review of the Human Spaceflight Plans. That was chaired by a gentleman named Norm Augustine, who has led several reviews in the past for NASA. Um, as part of that, and I'll get into the details here in a second, uh, NASA stood up a support team, I was on that support team, and then I led a subsequent uh, study uh, as requested by that support team over the summer, and basically what I'm going to present to you is the result of that study and where it's gone at this point, because um, it apparently does have some legs. Next slide, please. So, uh, due diligence uh, and proper attribution. Um, I was not the sole person that did this. A number of very smart people, independent of me, uh, did this, and the key people are in bold. Uh, Ames, uh, we've got at NASA, you know, we're the uh, National Acronym and Space Agency, so we have acronyms for everything. If you don't know, ARC is Ames Research Center, there's Langley Research Center, which is over in Virginia, uh, Glenn Research Center, which is in Ohio, Marshall, which is in Alabama, uh, JSC, which is at uh, um, Houston, um, headquarters, which we're not really sure where it is. <laughs> JPL, which is uh, down south here uh, in the LA Pasadena area. Um, and we had a really great team, and so I want to give due credit where credit's appropriate. Next slide, please. So let me give you the 30,000 foot overview to begin with. And we'll get a little bit into the why, the how, and the, and the what. Okay? So, and forgive me. Uh, I work in PowerPoint, so there's probably way too many words on here, um, but it's really light for NASA, so uh, <laughs> take that as a, with a grain of salt. The objective was overall to identify, keyword here, a flexible set of scenarios. This is not a prescribed, specific, sequential only path of you must do X, then Y, then Z, or it breaks. You could do a Z, and then Y, and then maybe go back to W. Okay, so the idea was how can we get out of, at the time, what was viewed as a very specific series of exploration steps that NASA was undergoing with the Constellation program. Uh, we're going to go here, and we're going to do this, and then we're going to go to the moon, and we're going to do this, and then we're going to go here and do that, and it had to be just so. Um, that was prescribed to us by, actually, the Human Spaceflight Plans Committee. One of the key members is a Dr. Ed Crowley at MIT. He said, let's figure out a flexible set of scenarios, and then let's flesh it out. The scope is uh, broad and not as deep as we would like, though it's gotten a little deeper subsequently. Uh, it was an initial analysis of a series of what we call, again, at NASA in Geek Talk, a design reference mission. You'll hear me say this a couple times. We call them DRMs because we don't want to say those long phrases every time. It just means a template. Okay, there's a template of how you'd want to do a mission, right? And people have been generating, you know, here's how we should go to Mars, here's how we should go to the moon, here's how we should go to asteroids for decades, literally, back to God, okay? So there's a huge volume of work that's out there that's very good and very rational. We mined to that work, we collected some sets of it, and then we updated it and kind of smoothed it over and glued it together. That's what we did. It took us three and a half months, basically four months. Um, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. We really needed to get into the nitty gritty of, you know, is it this versus that? Is it A versus B? But we set the general template and the general outline. What we came up with is what we call a, a set of flexible path missions. The idea is that the US, and again, yes, I work for the US government, so I am biased. 
the U.S. is leading the human exploration for the world. That's simple. Okay? Maybe somebody else is going to do it, but in my world, <laughs> the U.S. is leading human exploration for the Earth. Uh, the idea is that there are regular, in the terms of every year or two, crewed missions, as, not as like gross, but crewed as in populated human uh, people, men and women, missions that go out and do something uh, relevant in gender interest by the populace and provide detailed scientific return. Uh, the, camp, the campaign, meaning this overall scenario set of missions I'm going to talk about, culminates, it ends when we get to Mars. It doesn't end before we get to Mars. Mars is set out as our long-term goal. Now, we're talking mostly about, now you'll see when I get to the end, I'm in Mars Phobos orbit, okay? Um, the idea behind that is a bunch of other people have already done tremendously good studies on how to get to the Mars surface. I don't need to repeat that. I'm talking about what happens in between now and actually landing on Mars. And we're not gonna land on Mars next week. There's a lot of work to do. So there needs to be a plan of how to get from point A to point M, being Mars. That's what I'm gonna talk about. Next slide. So again, there's a lot of geograph engineering here, but there was this human space flight HSF committee commissioned by President Obama on May 7th, 2009, okay? Uh, they had one goal, assess human space flight goals. What should we be doing? Period, what should we be doing? They set up uh, four teams, really. One to look at the space station, which is called the ISS and, and NASA vernacular. Um, one to look at exploration beyond low Earth orbit. One to look at integration of all the various multi-agency things. How do we work with NSF, DOD, DARPA, da 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 And how do we get into low Earth orbit, okay? Those were the four groups. Uh, I was supporting the exploration beyond LEO group, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about whether or not crude, uh, or excuse me, commercial launch systems could or should or would support this. I think they can, I think they will, I think they might. Um, but I didn't do that analysis, that was over here. We talked about once you're in space, what are you gonna do, where are you gonna go, why are you gonna do it? And then how? Uh, a gentleman named Dr. Ed Crowley, who's the chair of the MIT Astro Aer Aerospace Department, um, led that study and um, a number of excellent uh, members that were appointed on the commission uh, did the basic analysis. But when it got down to the nitty gritty of crunch the numbers, do the uh, raw material, that fell back to NASA. Next slide, please. So on May 21st, remember May 7th, this commission gets stood up. On May 21st, NASA, well actually probably right before that, NASA was contacted by the committee and they said, hey, we want you, NASA, to support us we're gonna do this big analysis and we want a bunch of worker bees to come in, help us out. Um, I was a worker bee volunteered by Ames. Uh, so we were called the NASA, NASA Engineering Analysis Team. We basically gathered all this data for them that they wanted, all this background on what have we done here and how have we done it there, fed it to those members of the committee. On the 26th of June, and you, I'm doing the dates so you can see the rapidity, the speed with which this was done, June 26, Ed says, hey, I want you to look at five specific scenarios that I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you these scenarios. On the 30th, uh, I was stuck as a scenario lead for one of the scenarios. And we had till the July 22nd. So notice June 30th, July 22nd. We had four weeks, three really, um, to pull something together. And there were five scenarios. Scenario one, or scenario A, let's do this uh, alphabetically, because that's how they were referred to, uh, was basically lunar base. That's the, that was the existing constellation program. Let's go, let's build a lunar base. They asked for some specific questions here, I'm not gonna get into the detail, about uh, the lunar base. Uh, scenario B was lunar global. That's the idea of let's skip a base, let's just land a whole bunch of places all over the moon and see what we can figure out and then figure out what to do next. Scenario C was we're just not gonna go to the moon unless there's some very specific reason that we need to go to the moon in order to get to Mars. In other words, we're not gonna go to the moon for the moon's sake. 
forget that. Only if we must do something, test something, figure out something, learn something, in order to get to Mars, are we going to go to the moon? And what is that set of things? Okay. Scenario C was just forget the moon altogether. Let's just forget every other heavenly body completely and just go straight to Mars. Skip go, don't collect your $200, just get to Mars as fast as you can, throw everything at it, and Mars meaning the surface of Mars. No vicinity of counts, only the surface. Scenario E was a little bit of the, the dopey in the seven doors here. Um, it is the flexible path. Let's try virtually everything else. Throw it into a bag and see what happens. Next slide, please. So we were given, and I wish I could say we thought it up. It wasn't that uh, unique, but Ed came up with a specific set of things he wanted us to look at. He said, let's look at a sequence of things you would do and see if we can actually pull it off, OK? Um, and so number one was, let's have an unpiloted, but using like the Orion spacecraft, the next generation uh, spacecraft that has, is, and still may be being designed for NASA, um, to go to a sun Earth Lagrange point. That's what L1 means. That means it's a, it's a point um, leading or trailing the orbit of the Earth as it orbits around the sun. Why would we do that? Well, because it's about 5 million miles away. We have a bunch of uh, big telescopes sitting there, both international and, and US. We could service them. Plus, it actually gets us into deep space, right? That's a big deal. We've only been in the you know protective low Earth orbit uh, for the last 20 years, or uh, since 72, um, and so it gets us out into basically interplanetary space and outside of the Earth's magnetosphere, which is a big deal, as we will come to, uh, which is really our big protective bubble in space. Number two, let's look at a, a lunar flyby. Remember Apollo 8? Go fly around the moon, come back, prove you can do it. Woohoo! Uh, number three, let's go to a Sun Earth, uh, not a Lagrange 2, but this time specifically to do a Hubble class servicing mission of some of the telescope, telescopic systems out there. Um, go out and look at another Sun Earth Lagrange point, uh, mostly to measure the radiation environment with the crew, which is a big deal, so we're talking a long duration thing. Fly several missions to NEOS, another ac acronym here, forgive me. This is basically a near-Earth asteroid. I know it says O, and O means object. Trust me, we're talking about going to a near-Earth asteroid. That's the hard body, not the spewing gas body. We don't want to go there. Um, number six, flyby missions to Mars with robots being managed by the crew. Um, and then a Mars Phobos run <coughs> and maybe a sample return. And then we were asked, uh, hey, could you go to Venus, by the way, and see what you could do there? So we were given kind of this hodgepodge, not necessarily sequential in any sense, and told to take a look at it. Next slide, please. Excuse oh, me, go I'm, ahead. I'm curious as to the process that led to that, that list. Was that, in a lot of these, there's old things that have been sitting around for a while, but was there any idea of looking outside the box and exploring new ideas? or? Well, so again, if you notice, these are mostly goal-oriented. It's not necessarily how to get there, A. So we weren't given that criteria of the how. Uh, this is a hodgepodge very much of different targets. How many times have you heard of the manned Venus mission being discussed by NASA? Very few times. Um, and I premise to you there's only so many uh, uh, bodies in the inner solar system you can go to, and I think we've pretty much hit them all, right? We got the moon, we got Mars, we got the Lagrange points, which are stable gravitational points, and we've got near-Earth asteroids. And no, then we threw in Venus for a bonus. So that's about, that's about as big as the box exists if we want to stay somewhere in the uh, uh, inner solar system. Mercury is outside the box. Yeah, way out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. We, we can barely orbit it. We're just now orbiting a spacecraft around Mercury, and it's a big, <coughs> big, big deal. It's just way a lot. I can talk to you a little offline about that if you like. But these are exploration missions, not like Kepler, for example, Excellent. fall into this. Excellent value of the point. The, these should not be construed as NASA's only targets. This is only with the premise that people in the next 20, 30 years, probably 40, 50 years, would go to these. NASA as an agency and the scientific community as uh, an overall body has a much broader interest in the whole solar system and then 
the rest of the universe. And we're doing lots of cool stuff, but most of that is remote viewing of it. Some of it is deep space probes all the way out to Pluto. I'm not talking about unmanned missions, I'm talking about, thank you, Jeff, manned missions. Point data. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, I, I leave this for offline reading. Key point here is we were given ground rules, meaning here's things you must assume, and then we made assumptions, meaning, well, if we have to assume these, well, we're gonna assume these too. Why? Because they made sense, they made our lives easier, we only had four or five weeks to do it anyway, so we pulled it off. Um, key points here, uh, we were staying out of deep gravity wells, meaning that our point in our missions and looking at the flexible path was we were not gonna be landing on the surface of every big object, meaning didn't mean we had to go to the surface of the moon. Didn't mean we had to go to the surface of Mars. Didn't mean we had to go to the surface of Venus. Getting in orbit was good enough for us. We'd send robots. That was key assumption. Key ground rule, actually. Okay? We were using all the Constellation launch vehicle stuff that had been designed at the time, circa 2009. Okay? Uh, we were using the Orion capsule. We were presuming there were going to be a lot of robotic precursors, meaning we were going to send missions to these places before we sent people to check it out, understand what was happening. We made a whole bunch of assumptions that we were looking to do this with one crewed flight, meaning one, one set of a crew, that it was three to five people, um, that later in the 2020s we were going to have what was called nuclear thermal propulsion available to us if we needed it, and that our maximum mission duration for the crew was two years. Mind you, the current maximum mission duration for the crew, any person in space, is six months. And they take your badge away and you have to sit down. Right? And the reason is there's too much radiation build up over time. Okay? And we do not know how to mitigate for that. And we don't want all our astronauts dying of cancer, losing their hair, and, and becoming poster children for not doing exploration. So it's a relatively important thing that we have not learned how to deal with yet, how to deal with deep space radiation. So we're saying we can get away with two years and that's crossing our fingers, holding our breath, and thinking of some nice breakthroughs that we don't know, know yet what they are. There okay? is one Soviet cosmonaut who was actually up for more than a year, wasn't he? That's correct. People have broken this. This is a guideline that NASA uses, the six month guideline. Every individual is different, so some people could handle it a lot longer, some people a lot less, and it's likely that we can go probably a lot farther than six months, but that's our cautionary practice. Shouldn't you make a distinction between space station, low Earth orbit, and deep space for that? I can, but that's true. Months? That's true for no. That's true for uh, that's true for uh, six months on station. They have a they have a two year window, and they can only do six months, and then they get checked out. And if they don't pass, they don't go again. Now, that's why it's normally two rotations of three months each on space station, Dave. And there's no different rule for deep space. They don't know diddle about deep space, <laughs> so they go with the existing rule. Well, that's right. Unless somebody builds something to do that. I'm sorry. So Eugene? Jim I, thought Prometheus, <coughs> I thought Prometheus was killed. Where does it say Prometheus? That's the NTR. Again, we made some assumptions. See assumptions? Yeah. <laughs> we made some assumptions. Why? Because, you know, if you need to unobtainium, you call up the media <laughs> to bring that up. That's a no degree to, yes sir. So, uh, Jim Logan at Johnson uh, gave a, a few presentations specifically about lunar bases and maybe uh, Martian surface operations. Right. And, and he was literally talking about an EVA time li limits in the hours <coughs> per month. That's correct. Um, and also perhaps even um, uh, module habitation. So that there'd have to be, a, I guess, a really heavy amount of shielding you're going out of the, uh, uh, that's correct. That's a, and don't forget, on the moon, you are, your whole backside is covered by 6,000 miles of regolith. So you only have to deal with this 180 view. When you're in deep space, you're kind of there. Okay. So we get into a little bit on the mitigation stuff that we've dealt with, but again, that is one of the technological um, things that must be solved, right, before we go and do this. Next slide, please. Sorry, but did you have to do cost models also? We, uh, another NASA group did, and they came up with huge numbers that were equivalent to Constellation, but actually cheaper in the end. I did not do the cost models, and I don't have access to those. Those are 
for reasons you might guess, <clears throat> not being published. Um, suffice it to say it was cheaper, which is maybe, maybe not one of the reasons the whole NASA is currently in turmoil figuring out what they're going to do. This is my cartoon of the flexible path, okay? These are the key um, ground rules and, and assumptions, okay? Um, mixed. The idea was piloted missions, meaning human missions, to many places. That was a key goal. Orbit planets stay out of the gravity well for the moment, rendezvous with small bodies. <clears throat> Do surface exploration telerobotically, meaning people commanding and controlling robots at various levels of autonomy. Make it a visible series of missions, noted, predefined, big PR, not we keep going back to the same place every time, we're going to new places every couple years. Okay? Why? PR. Why do you guys buy McDonald's? PR. Okay? There's a reason behind this. Regular return of new scientific knowledge. Considering how little we actually know about the solar system, that's not as hard as you might think. Literally going anywhere and bringing anything back will give us new scientific knowledge. So it's an easy win, but I need to point it out that that's a key factor. It may not be what exactly any particular scientist that you talk to wants to do, but that's a different qualification. New versus mine of interest are different things. Uh, again, uh, we're looking for a general capability. We were minimizing what we call destination-specific systems. We were looking for a lunar lander that only landed on the moon and didn't land on Mars and couldn't run to with asteroids. We weren't looking for that. We were looking for general capability. Next slide, please. Okay, so what did we do? Pretty cartoon. We were given a bunch of stuff. We did a bunch of thinking. We looked at where the gaps were because we couldn't do this without this unobtainium technology gap. And we came up with a series and sequence of scenarios. It's all you need to really understand about that cartoon. You can understand more if you like, but really that's all we did. Okay, next slide please. Okay, couple key points. Uh, again, um, Orion is the... Uh, prescribed, you know, NASA vehicle. Look, it's a big, supersized Apollo. That's de facto what it is. It does a lot more, but that's, it looks like it because the physics of how you re-enter the Earth's atmosphere works that way, and we like that type of shape versus the Soviets, or excuse me, the Russians who like a different type of shape. It's okay, but that's our shape, and then we're going with it. Um, we made a couple other modifications that we would have some sort of, and we're going to call it an inflatable hat versus a hard canister, thinking a Coke can, which is up there on the space station now. Think a balloon. You inflate it, but it's multi-layer thick of Kevlar and all this great material. Rubber inner bladder keeps the air. Uh, we would have an inflatable hat, and we would have consumables for 90 plus days, meaning we would have air and water. We weren't looking necessarily for some wonderful uh, recyclable Food stuff machine, those would be great, they, those would help. And we needed radiation protection for longer duration deep space missions. We knew it, it was a hook. We had to say it every time though because it, it, it is a constraining factor. Um, next slide. Question on the yes, sir. CEV. Um, when is the current schedule for the first reentry test flight? For what? The CEV? CEV? Today, I could not tell you. In, in 2007, it was between 212 and 214. That's right. In 2007, it was. Currently, they're not even sure we're going to have a CDV, oh. though it looks like we probably will. Um, so I can't, I honestly can't tell you because I don't know, and I don't know that they know when they're going to be doing a reentry test. Thank you. Sure. Okay. A couple other things we were asked to do. <clears throat> Remember, I told you at the beginning, we were not asked to look at whether, which launch vehicle would get us there, whether or not it'd be a commercial one or a Constellation one. We were told we would have access to the Constellation Aries launch vehicles. Then, oh, right around the 22nd of July, say as we were briefing this out the first time, they said, oh, could you look at what would happen if we gave you various in-space propulsion stages sized at, you know, small, medium, and large. That's what we were given. Small, medium, large. This is metric tons, 25 metric tons. Right? So that's like 60,000 pounds to give you uh, a weight equivalent to this mass. Uh, the idea then is that they would go up empty and we could fill them up. 
So we would launch this big fat one empty, it weighed about 28 and a half metric tons, but we could fill it up with just a ton of fuel. And if we had that, what could we do with these things? So we were asked to refine our analysis, and, and the reason I'm telling you we had to do this is because I'm not going to give you the interim analysis, I'm going to give you the end analysis. And you'll see we make use of big, medium, and small stages. And these are the said size, big, medium, and small. Somehow we fill them up on orbit with a gas station. How do we get the fuel up there? I don't know. How is it stored up there? I don't know. I'm just telling you, I don't know. But those were the assumptions we were allowed to make. And if you notice, this is where NASA is going. We're now looking at doing refueling in space. Why? Because it does make some sense. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> Lovely bar graph. This is the only really messy one like this in, 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 sorry, in sorry, the package. Sorry, yes. Sorry, no problem. The in fuel re uh, in, in space refueling. Yes. Are you saying that's going to be adopted as kind of an architecture policy? That is being looked at as being adopted <coughs> as an architecture policy by NASA. It's in the mix. Two years ago, not in the mix. Today, in the mix. And the um, final decisions on that? Uh, the final decisions have not been made. There was an out I'll tell I'll tell you a little bit where we are today at the very end. Um, I expect by the new year we should know. Um, so we did uh, small, medium, large. Here's the pitch. Along the bottom here, that's all you need. You don't need to read or, read or eye strain. These are all the different little missions, okay? Each one different, starting in un unpiloted lunar live uh, flyby all the way up to a Venus flyby. Here's the key analysis point you need to know. With small, we can do the early ones, can't do any of the interesting asteroids, and need multiple upper uh, of these stages to actually even get close to Mars, and really can't take much of this. Uh, with the medium, we can get all the way out there and do some of the real cheap and easy near-Earth asteroids, and can do okay getting to Mars and Venus, it just takes a long time. With the big one, we can do everything we want. There you go, that's the key. Okay, next slide please. So, here's the cartoon picture of what I'm talking about. Uh, for the initial inner solar system capability, we're talking, this is called a, a, an in-space stage, also sometimes called an EDS or an Earth departure stage, lots of acronyms for that. This is a picturesque version of a inflatable habitation volume. Think two to three times uh, what the hab volume is of a, of a tin can, space station hab volume, but very useful. Uh, and then, of course, our lovely little CEV, which is actually the command module uh, and the reentry module for the crew uh, back to Earth. Um, and Mars orbit time, we were looking potentially at a nuclear thermal capability. The idea uh, is that we found quite easily that uh, the Ares then, as then designed rockets, the Ares 5 and the Ares 1, along with existing what are called expendable launch vehicles from either Lockheed or Boeing, which were the two at the time and to date that actually can launch stuff reliably in orbit. Um, that's all we really needed. That would do it. We could pull it off. Um, if we wanted to do uh, a lot of propellant, depots in orbit, again, we could do it. You, you need to launch a lot of propellant in orbit, but you can do it. Um, and you need to have a place for it to stay. Probably not a space station, but you need something kind of de facto like, like a space station. Powered, keeping the fuel cool, having a place for people to go and top off. If you don't have that, you're making it hard. You, you can do it, you know, vehicle at a time with uh, gas cans, but you're making it hard. Okay, next slide, please. Again, as I stated, uh, the idea here is that by necessity, you don't send people to completely unknown environments. You do if you have to, but if you don't have to, you don't. And we can send robots everywhere, and frankly, sometimes better than we can send people to virtually any place in the solar system. <coughs> so it makes sense to utilize that and find out a little bit about where you're going with some precursors. Uh, precursors to any of the near-Earth asteroids, understand, because right now all we see with them is a bright speck of light. That's it. Unless we do a flyby with a robot, they're just a bright speck of light and we're making a good guess based on the color of the light, of what it's made of. Um, so we need to figure out what their physical characteristics really are before we show up. Are they a dust ball? Are they spinning wildly? Are they hard as a hard, hard block of iron? What are they? We don't know. 
Um, any sort of robotic surface exploration <clears throat> of the planets we want to go to, we assume we would put the robots there first and the people would show up and take over command and control. Farms exploration rovers have been doing a great job for six years. It's not unbelievable we can make that happen. Big, key, big piece of the Mars exploration goal has always been to understand really what's on the surface and that's best done by getting a sample back in the hands of humans. So Mars sample return has always been kind of like this. Before we actually send people there, if we could only have a piece of this stuff, we would learn so much. So we, we, we map that into our architecture of things that were important to try to do. Um, and of course, these don't preclude other wonderful robotic missions. These were just known must-haves uh, for us as we laid out this architecture. Next slide, please. <clears throat> OK. Um, I'm getting to the punchline here very soon, which is really just a simple set of cartoons that I will show you. But in order to get there, I want to emphasize once again that there are enabling technologies that we must have and do not yet have before we can do this, period. Okay. So we can't say if we only had enough money we could do this and if they just got out of our way it would all happen. We can't say that because that would be a lie. We must develop these things and we have some good ideas. We have some very smart people working on this stuff but we don't know how to do it. You know how to go out and start your car and drive away, great. You do not know how, probably, how to jump out of an airplane today. Some of you do, but most of you probably don't. So you can't say you know how. Other people may, and we may figure it out, but you have to go learn. We have to go learn this, or it can't be done. I know I'm being pedantic and emphasizing this, perhaps unnecessarily, but I, I have a pet peeve, which is thinking we can really do this if NASA just simply was given a bucket of money. We could, but we developed this first for the first 10 years. Trust me, that's what we have to do. Okay, we got to keep any of the propulsion we stick up in orbit from basically evaporating away. There's no sun, there's no clouds up there. It's either really hot or really cold. And when it's really hot, it's really hot. <laughs> okay, so any uh, condensed gas like oxygen or hydrogen, <coughs> right, or methane that we want to use as a fuel, a chemical fuel system for our engines must be kept really cold. And we don't know how to do that. We're doing little tests, but we don't know how. We, we must then know how to take it from one sloshing zero-g pile to another sloshing zero-g pile. And we don't know how to do that either. We're working on it, but we don't know how to do it. If we really want to get to Mars, or we want to get to any of these places in any decent amount of time, we can skip the zero-g uh, and, and, and uh, in-space uh, gas station and go for the electric car, so to speak, <coughs> the in-space nuclear, either nuclear thermal, or nuclear electric, but nuclear thermal because it's got a higher push, so to speak, okay? But we can do it without it. So this is only enhancing. It makes our job easier. And we tried this once back in 2003 and 2004, and it's like half a billion dollars just to, just to enter the game. So it's a, you, we could do it, but you know, if we're gonna do it, it's half a billion dollars just to pony up to the table to start talking about it, okay? So it's a big, expensive thing to do if we're going to do it. Closed loop ECLS, that's Environmental Closed Loop Life Support System or something like that. It's, this, is, this is your recyclable air, water, food. Okay, so we don't have everything in Ziploc baggies and then we throw it away. We really need to have this if we're going to be out there for any period of time. Um, big one, human radiation and zero-g countermeasures, robust enough to enable two years. Yeah, well, they're not going to die probably after two years, but they may be completely incapacitated when they come back to the Earth. Or maybe they will die. We, we don't know. Key piece, we don't know. Proximity ops in, sorry, this is a mute, microgravity rendezvous. So when we get near an asteroid and it's out there spinning around wildly, you know, space station just kind of sits there. And it doesn't do a whole lot when we're there because they don't want to confuse us. Right? It sits there and we go up and we dock with it. This is a big thing, and I, I wish I'd brought a picture, because uh, I have it. Where space station's this little thing here, and the smallest asteroid we've been to recently, eating cow, is like over here. So we're talking an order of magnitude bigger, and it's moving. 
and spinning and has stuff coming off of it perhaps. We just don't know. So we don't know how to actually go out there and kind of rendezvous with it in a nice, harmless way. Think of a, a boat that's going berserk and you're at, in a little skiff and you want to get on board. Good luck, right? <laughs> you, we don't know how to do that. <clears throat> and the crew right now is on a very long, thick, fat cable of information to the ground that tells them when to do things, how to do things, what to do. Why? Not because they're stupid, it's because they're overworked. They have too much to do, and their system is like a Winnebago from the 1960s. And you want a Beamer of 2010, that you just press the button and everything comes on and your seat adjusts and everything. Now they're in a Winnebago. It doesn't do crud for you. So there's no automation technologies on any of the spacecraft right now. Really, the shuttle is 70s technology like you just would not believe, okay? So we don't have the right systems built to allow a crew to basically fly its own vehicle with no ground. We don't have it yet. You could get it, but we're not there. Emphasis, sorry. Okay, next slide, and then I'll stop being pain. <laughs> so, the flexible path. Here was the general tenor of what we came out of. It's relatively obvious. This really was not brain surgery. You look at uh, small missions of minimum capability, one to two weeks, lunar flyby, Earth-Moon Lagrange points, which are in and around the Earth-Moon system, <clears throat> was, the next, was the next point. We called it near-Earth missions. Uh, we could do it very simply with the lightweight launch systems of commercial systems in the Ares-1. We could do it with multiple commercial launch systems in the Ares-1 for near-Earth. Once we got where we wanted to actually go into the Sun-Earth vicinity, we figured, and, and we did the actual analysis, so there's math behind this. We figured out what you could do, we figured out the trajectories, we figured out all the weights of everything and, and calculated it all out. Once you got to the point where you wanted to do Sun-Earth stuff, you really needed this heavy lift launch system. You just you couldn't do it. You'd be launching you know, 10 or 15 of those, and that's silly. You, you, can't, you can't do it. Um, operational. <laughs> And the capabilities we would need would be needed to be an upgrade from these. <clears throat> we could get to limited solar system, inner solar system, on the order of 200 day durations, which included most near Earth asteroids that we were going to need to worry about. Of course, and I'm sorry, yes, sir. Earlier you referred to interesting asteroids as those being further away, but then you implied that smaller asteroids would be easier to um, explore. And I'm wondering why you don't have any smaller NEOs on the middle 90 day duration mission? So it's not the size of the NEO, right? Um, one, the size of the NEO is largely determined by the NEO and nothing we can do with it. We're looking for when the, the NEO or the near Earth asteroid comes close enough for us at the right time mm -hmm. for us to go out and visit. And they do it all on their own. We can't arrange it, right? right? So either we wait for a close one, right? Or we go out to a one that's a little bit farther away that is not yet close to the Earth, but someday will be. Okay. Can can we extrapolate <coughs> on our current discovery rates from, for example, the Wise mission, and uh, anticipate that by 2015, it's very likely that we'll know about a lot of very small uh, asteroids and even comets that are in the 90-day vicinity. We would hope so, and we are. If you if you look at the small bodies database, we're getting literally hundreds of objects you know every couple of months we get a thousand or more a year of new objects coming in so the curve of what we are discovering through remote sensing like wise like uh, other things and i'll let dave talk in a sec is just going up dramatically now dave morrison knows specifically I, I don't want to go into all that except for one thing close means dynamically close yes for instance these two guys that are going between us and the moon uh, would not be suitable targets because they are not dynamically close. They're zipping by. Right, we just can't catch up to them. Right, we want something that's slowly wandering by in our vicinity. In six dimensions. We're going to see you, and then we're going to wander away again. And, and that's what we visit when it's close by. Okay? Um, and we ride it, so we ride it in a little bit, play on board, and then jump off and come home. Right, right. six dimensionally close, right? Correct. Time, space, velocity. Okay? So, other points, uh, you know, then we looked at big missions where we went basically to any near-Earth asteroid we wanted, meaning it was in between, say, Venus and Mars, and at some point we rendezvoused close, say, within 5 million miles of the Earth, but we didn't have to go to it when it was only 5 million miles close to the Earth. We could go when it was farther away. Um, 
but it's in the kind of Earth, Mars, Venus area, turf, not out in the far asteroid belt. And we looked at a Mars Phobos mission. Okay, so those are the kind of stepping stones, so to speak, that we looked at. Now I'm going to get into a little bit of the detail on those. Next slide, please. And I'm going to go through these quick because I think I'm coming up on my time. Yeah. Um, and so I'll punch through these and then talk about the general architecture that we presented real quick in the cartoon and give you where we are now. So again, the idea basically is pretty simple here. Cartoons are you launch what is called this uh, in-space <coughs> propulsion stage. You launch the crew, you rendezvous, they fly out, we do a fly around the moon. It's very, very, very similar to what happened in Apollo 8. Okay, virtually the same except we use uh, Saturn V instead of two vehicles at the time. So we launched all that at once, went out and did it, and came back. I'm sorry? Apollo 8 actually put 10 orbits around the moon. They was a Apollo 8, well, there was a, that's, that may be true. Well, I couldn't swear, I couldn't swear to that. never flew any out and back. Apollo 13 was the free return. Well, Thank you. Apollo 13 was the free return, but Apollo 8, Apollo 8 did go into uh, lunar orbit. We're not talking about going to lunar orbit, though. But in order to go into lunar orbit, you need to get on the free return trajectory. We're simply going to do the free return. We didn't have a uh, uh, the target of going into lunar orbit for this particular. This was simply going out to the moon and back. And next slide, please. Sorry, got everything on that. Um, for like an Earth-Moon Lagrange point, where you're placing something, this is a cartoony picture of like the James Webb Telescope, which is not going there. But that, again, these are cartoons. The idea, again, you launch an upper stage, you launch uh, the crew, you dock in orbit, you go out and you would either in place uh, a telescope asset or you maintain it uh, and then you come back. Again, these were just notionals because we had to do the analysis for each of the stages of how we do this. Next question, next slide please. Uh, Sun Earth Lagrange looks remarkably the same. The only point is this is much farther away than the Earth Moon Lagrange point. Now you're way outside the magnetosphere. Uh, you're actually in deep space. You're, you're playing with fire, so to speak, and your crew's out there a fair bit, a fair bit longer. Next slide please. Well, there's a big difference if you go to one or two. There is. There is. And, and if you remember our stepping stone, the, you'd start uh, with two, I think, first, which is still in the tail, and then come into one. Right. Uh, for near-Earth uh, near asteroid mission, we were presuming we would have access to a heavy lift, which would allow us to launch a, a more robust um, in-space stage and uh, a habitation module, um, send out the crew, uh, rendezvous with the NEO, ride it in, so to speak, until we got closer, hop off, come home, re-enter. Okay, and there's papers and studies uh, on this a lot. Yes, sir? What's the robot currently planned for that? Is that the R2 for the uh, exploration of the neuroception? No, uh, R2 is only, which is called Robonaut 2, is only going to the International Space Station. It's launching at the, probably in the last shuttle flight, and may be tested interior to the space station 2011. There's an idea to send a robotic precursor to an asteroid, but that's a planned mission, a proposed mission, hasn't been approved. It's just kind of in concept right now. Uh, so come back. Next slide. Um, we looked at one very funky one, uh, which was actually uh, worked up uh, back in the 80s, <clears throat> where you can actually do an analysis where you, you go out, you fly by uh, Mars, and actually you come back with underneath uh, the, <clears throat> the Venus orbit and can actually rendezvous um, if everything, if the worlds are all aligned, so to speak, with Venus. <laughs> and there are conjunctions where, which allows that to occur. So we, we got our, uh, our twofer there. Uh, we went to Mars and went to Venus, did a flyby at the same time. Um, because you're not landing on the surface, you're not actually slowing down even as you go by Mars. You're just kind of screaming by, trains passing in the night. Um, it doesn't take that much propellant. It takes a lot of time, but it doesn't take that much fuel, so to speak. You're kind of coasting as you go. Um, next slide, please. Um, we looked very much at what we call a Phobos rendezvous and Mars sample return. The idea that you would, uh, the, the goal of the humans was to go out and rendezvous with Phobos and Deimos, do uh, some uh, exploration there, but pre-send out a um, surface sample return Think of a Mars exploration rover class or Mars science 
laboratory class rover that would go out, collect samples, and then launch it into low Mars orbit. The, the, the crew would then come by and collect at some future time. Right? This was kind of a pick your best of both worlds idea. Next slide, please. Uh, the basic idea behind that for the Mars sample return, you launch it on a commercial system, you land it down there, uh, it does a snatch and grab, sends out maybe a couple different rovers, eventually they take it back to a, uh, a Mars ascent vehicle, but instead of having to launch all the way home, which is really challenging, uh, meaning all the way back to Earth, you simply launch into a stable Mars orbit and kind of put on the beacon, come get me, come get me, come get me, and eventually we'll come get it when, five years, 10 years, who knows, but it, it gives you a point of interest to go out and get it, right? Um, it's a tease, so to speak. Um, next slide, please. So here's the notional timeline. Note the deliberate lack of years here. <laughs> you start in year zero and you move your way out. So note that there are really not years in the sense of this is one year and then two years. There are mission classes that occur in some sequential notional basis. This is what we presented as our notional flexible path. Can I skip your number three? Yeah, you sure could. Can I skip number six? Yeah, okay, sure. Right, it's a flexible path. The idea though is that these are of increasing difficulty as we go along the axis this way, right? This is relatively much more straightforward. This is really hard. And then we had, we were, again, we were given lots of sort of, oh, by the way, could use. Um, we were told, oh, do a splitter and say, now after you've done this, let's go back to the moon and just put a big base there. Okay, tell us what that looks like. Oh, no, go back and just go to Mars and skip the moon altogether and tell us what that looks like. And we came up with these various scenarios, presented them out, um, and identified uh, required, as we thought anyway, requisite precursor robotic missions. Not simply to gather science, but to gather preliminary information for the manned missions. And so this is what we presented. Um, if you look, I can, I, on the uh, Augustine report that got published, you'll see this chart. You know, this is what's in the, in the bright glossy, right? And there's a very nice write-up on this. And uh, if you actually want details, I recommend uh, that human HSF report, which is a PDF online available at nasa.gov. Uh, and there have been several papers written from this as well, if you want the gory details. Um, so that's where we are then. Where we are today is, next slide please. Ah, actually, sorry, a synopsis. <clears throat> First, the synopsis. So, flexible path, what were the goals? Stay out of those nasty gravity wells, have it repeatable, uh, relevant, um, regular missions human exploration missions, not we go once and then come back 40 years later, but every n number of years, there's a relevant mission that occurs, um, that we go out and gather lots and lots of science that there's great science that can be done. Now, yes, we're doing it as an add-on to the exploration, not for the science, but because of the exploration that doesn't mitigate or minimize the science value we gain. It's just different stuff. and we get significant public engagement by having a regular measured uh, series of exploration activities for the manned spaceflight mission to do. Uh, why do we want that? Well, guess what? They pay our bills, right? Not the public themselves, they pay, but it goes into this big kitty and then Congress argues about it. So if the public cares about this stuff, we tend to get funded. If the public doesn't care about this stuff, simple enough, we tend not to get funded. That's the motivation. It's crass, but it's true. Uh, now, next slide, please. Where are we now? Um, President Obama and uh, the current NASA Administrator, uh, Charlie Bolden, in uh, February of this year, in 2010, kind of said, whoa, let's kind of put a stop to that whole Constellation program. Let's rethink this. And that's the nicest way of saying it. And they've been working on it for the past several months. And it seems like forever to us in NASA, but it's only been several months. And they chartered a team over this summer called the Human Exploration uh, Framework Team, HEFT. And they came up with basically, can we put a little bit more legs on all these different ideas and see what we want to do? And uh, they're briefing to Charlie, I believe, on Friday, this Friday. Today's September 8th, 
And today's September 8th, and on September 10th, they're going to brief to the administrator, and we'll see what he says. The idea is to get a thumbs up, thumbs down on to some of these class missions fit. And do I know that some of these class missions are in there? Yeah, I do. But have I seen the charts? No, I have not. Um, fall of this year, actually starting on Monday, is what's called heft two, meaning we're going to add a lot more legs, or we're going to flesh out these design reference missions um, and try to really identify what, why, how, and when we do these things, and how we would align NASA's technical investments, meaning what we're going to fund, who we're going to fund, what we're going to try to do, in order to do these things. That's supposed to be a four-month activity. Um, I'll be participating in that, and that should be completed at the end of this uh, calendar year. So by the new year, we will probably again be briefing the administrator, and he will be giving us a thumbs up, thumbs down of, yeah, that looks good, or go back and try that again. And we are hoping that NASA will have a clear, hoping that NASA will have a clear set of criteria uh, of how we're going to do manned exploration and where we're going to go at the beginning of 2011. That's what I've got for you. I will now take questions for a few minutes. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So what happened to scenarios A through D? Are those being briefed separately or are any of those in conflict with what you guys came up with? Uh, so they were not in conflict, but they were different. Um, so if you could quickly just go all the way back up to the top. All the way up, all the way up, all the way just yeah, wait, 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 yeah. wait, and go back down to the one more, one more, right here. Yeah. So uh, during last summer, 2009, the uh, Human Spaceflight Panel um, had different teams, really good teams for A, B, C, D, that also briefed out. The results of those are also in the HSF report. Again, really nicely done, really well documented, and there are again published uh, journal papers out there on some of these things. They decided that A was already constellation, B uh, wasn't particularly relevant, um, C there wasn't any particular must do on the moon to get to Mars, um, D we could do Mars but we didn't have the money, and so their bias was to preference the flexible path so that was within point. the scope of how much budget was being allocated to NASA at the time. And, and again, it's, it's in the HSF report. So these were all briefed out, and there's really great work on it as well. Um, what was necessary was subsumed under E. That's correct. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, Jeff. Um, I hate to say this, but there are some people who would look at this budget of billions of dollars, uh, lots of risk to, to human beings to learn about some chip of rock floating by <laughs> and compare that with a few million dollars to find out the origin and evolution of the universe through remote sensing. Wh where is that debate being held within NASA? So that debate is not being held within NASA to the best of my knowledge. Um, that comes back to the age old, should we be doing it robotically, observationally, or should we be sending people in point of presence to these places. That is a philosophical point, um, has both cost numbers and benefit numbers that are hugely constrained by whether you believe it is of more value for a person to be there or not. And again, I would argue that's philosophical because what are your metrics, right? Science return in a time instance, science return per dollar, and in, unless we all agree on what we're trying to measure, it becomes mostly a religious debate, if you'll forgive me, where it's faith-based, and if you want to have a fact-based thing, everybody should set the ground on dollars and science return, if that's what you view. There's a lot of people in NASA that don't view that dollars and science return are the metrics. It's dollars and exploration, and exploration as an AKA manifest destiny, for its own sake, is viewed as a significantly valuable goal by many people within NASA and within Congress. So I'll have a debate with you outside of this venue, but not here. <laughs> okay, but well, you did mention the, the fact that the public gets turned on by this kind of stuff, but they can also be turned on by sort of the intellectual part of cosmology and all that stuff. So it's it just a matter of, of PR and... Um, it could be. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Any other questions? Yes, sir. I, um, I'd suggest that the science and the PR are inextricably intertwined, and uh, a good science payload will always get you the best PR. So I'd like to ask what you think the best uh, science payloads in the running are for the first three of, of the Scenario E missions. Um, for the 14 yeah. Wait, wait, before you even ask, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be, uh, to be laughable at sure, all. Sure. My point is, um, the way the scientific community with the NASA has worked well is we basically say we're going to get you to this spot. Here's an idea of what you'd like to measure. Go out and propose for the best possible payload you can within a certain constraint of size, power, how hot and cold it can get, and people come up with amazing things. So I, I really couldn't tell you what those are because I don't know. Okay. Well, right. I, again, my, my caveat: question, I are an engineer. I am not a scientist. My question is: Have you heard anything better, for example, for the 14-day mission for placing a BLBI, a BLBI array on the uh, far side of the moon? Nope. Uh, have you heard anything better from the 21-day mission for a formation flight BLBI system? Nope. Haven't heard either nor anything better. And I'd ask you about a, a near-Earth object robot uh, uh, determining whether uh, shielding and or propulsion is available from an asteroid and or comet. But, uh, Those would be good, but I can't speak to whether they're better than any other interesting ideas. Thanks. Sir. Uh, can you do any of these uh, MEO class beyond the moon, beyond LEO missions without the gas station in space? And if not, uh, can you tell us a little more about what that means? So uh, we can do, um, if we had a big enough launch vehicle, like originally was being designed under the Constellation program called the Ares 5, uh, we could do up to some of the more, uh, some of the easier to access near Earth asteroids. So we could do the Lagrange points on a single launch, and we could do up to some of the easy near Earth asteroids. After that point, you simply run out of what in NASA's parlance is called the delta V, but the ability to move it fast enough to catch up to some object you really care about and stop when you get there. Okay, so you, you just need the fuel, and it, it, you're constrained if you're using chemical propulsion by how much fuel you can launch along with everything else. And so, if you had a some mythical fuel depot in space that you could simply fill up from, right, you could launch largely empty. Volume, strangely enough, is not our problem launching it into space. Big things, not a problem. Heavy things, problem. So you launch a bunch of small, light things, little fuel pellets, or whatever you call them, little plugs of, uh, of fuel, get it up there, consolidate it, and then fill up into your vehicle, and off you go. So it really comes down to, uh, if you're going to use chemical propulsion, you need a lot of fuel and you can't launch all that fuel at one time. So either you launch it really quick, right after each other, which we're not known for doing really well, <laughs> or you launch it slowly at a measured pace, pay for delivery on orbit, but then you have to some, have to some place it can be delivered to. And collected. Yeah. Right, and then collected, and then there's those two technical problems of say, keeping it cold and getting it from your spot to some other spot without it going everywhere. So presumably, that technology does sound modular and flexible to yep. me. So uh, has anybody been making a serious effort at fleshing that out? Yeah, that, that, as I mentioned in the very beginning, is actively being fleshed out and seriously looked at. Because it's a little bit painful that that could be useful. Painfully obvious that could be useful. Yes, sir? Yeah, you talked about human radiation and zero-g countermeasures for a two-year mission, yep. have you considered the need for psychology countermeasures? Because I just been reading Discover about Biosphere 2. Yeah. Two years in there, eight people, they came out in two groups of four that weren't talking to each other. Okay, so uh, <laughs> from, from a, a, a scientific layman standpoint, absolutely yes, I think you should do that. From the government standpoint, I'm not sure, okay, um, from the, if you talk to me in the parking lot standpoint, hell yeah, there's there's going to be a problem. A bunch of people in a small space for a long time. Think of the miners in Chile. It's a lot of stress, even if everybody loves each other. So yes, there must be considerate 
uh, assessment of the physiological and psychological uh, countermeasures necessary to allow people to do that. Like, you know, being trapped on a ship crossing the Atlantic in the 1600s. Some people just didn't make it. <laughs> okay, last one. Yes, sir. Any thoughts on why electric plasma propulsion is getting so much press? Why is it getting press? Well, in relation to this right now, it's not part of your... It wasn't in here, and that potentially is an oversight. There is a lot of value, uh, if you look at electric propulsion or plasma, plasma propulsion, the idea here is if you throw something, um, it's called, it all has to do with momentum. So without getting too technical, it's all about momentum. So if you throw something very heavy overboard, you just shove it overboard, your boat will slide this way. Makes sense, right? You show bricks out of the back of your boat, it will slide to the right, no problem. But if I get a squirt gun, I'm not going to go very fast unless I've got a hell of a fast hose. And then I can shoot a very thin shot of, of a liquid out the back, very fast, but a very little amount of it, and I'll still move. So if it's a little bit of stuff, like electric propulsion can push small amounts of atoms or plasma, but hellaciously fast. Or you can push a big amount of chemical fuel relatively slow. That, that's the value. But it seems like it's getting a lot of press now being thrown out as kind of milestones for these scenarios when there's tremendous technical <coughs> development required that is possibly <coughs> not in the near future. Uh, so actually, surprisingly enough, electric propulsion has been flown many times and is actually commercially available. The Russians will sell you uh, an ion thruster that put, they put on commercial satellites. Yeah, extremely small thrust. Extremely small thrust. And so in order to make it useful for human exploration, there's a lot of work to be done. For robotic stuff, though, there's some there's real, real value. If you look at the Dawn mission, um, which is going up to Ceres and Vespa, which are main belt asteroids out towards uh, Jupiter, it's using electric propulsion because it's a lot of value. Long time to really <coughs> add significant velocity. That's why it's not too relevant for man. But you could send big cargo out ahead of time. Yeah, it just seems like it's being really pushed to the press lately. And it, you know, it's I don't know. Why is that? Don't know. Okay. One more. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, hybrid electric railgun rockets. Any uh, progress on those that you can share? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll talk to people offline if you like. Thank you very much.